What's up guys? Welcome to the Chess Giant. This is Solomon Ordell and in today's video we got the Ready Gambit slash Ready opening. I threw both of these names in the video title as it's one of those openings with multiple names but I'm really speaking of the system in which case white plays out of three and now against d5 continues with c4. Very hyper dynamic option using a flank pawn and putting pressure right on that central square and pawn on d5. Now here there's really three different things that black can do. One of them is simply just capturing the pawn on c4. Another is going with the advanced variation of d4. And another solid option here for black is just defending the pawn on d5 with either c6 or e6. So we're going to be covering all three of these in this video. Let's first answer the obvious question. Okay, why can't black just take on c4? I actually don't think that this is a very good idea for black to accept this gambit because we're now going to play this move of e3. This looks very quiet and very subtle, but we're looking to capture on c4 with tempo and gain a very active game with some nice development. And here if black tries to hang on to the pawn on d5 with a move like bishop e6, this bishop first off with the Karras variation is somewhat awkwardly placed, and on top of that you simply cannot hang on to this pawn forever. I mean right now we could even play a move like knight a3, and how on earth is black going to continue to defend this pawn? If we see a move like knight f6, we now as white have a decision, and that's which minor piece to capture with on c4. I honestly think that either one is completely okay. It simply depends on which piece you would rather have standing at the end of this exchange. What do I mean by this? Well, if we take with the knight, we're basically saying, look, I don't really want my knight as much as my bishop. I'm okay with that knight being taken off the board. Same with this bishop on c4. Maybe some players really like having their knights on the board, so they want to take back with the bishop with knight takes c4 in mind. Most master and grandmaster level players seem to go with this idea of knight takes c4, whole idea being that we are putting some pressure in the central squares, including e5 and d6, and really both of these knights are making a huge presence currently over the entire chessboard. I mean, look at this entire range that these knights are covering, a ton of key dark squares, and here if black captures the knight off the board, we simply take back with the bishop. Now looking at ideas like queen b3, forming a battery ram against f7, and on top of that, attacking this pawn on b7. So here black would be smart to play a move like e6, but even then, we're still going to continue with queen b3, putting pressure on b7. Here if a move like b6, or even queen c8, in either case, we're just going to play castle and kingside, and d4, with white having a very smooth and easy game ahead. So y'all, following this move of e3, attacking that pawn on c4, if black plays something like bishop e6, we can simply play knight a3 and capture this pawn on c4 with either the knight or the bishop, although most players like to play knight takes c4. What about a move here like queen d5? Well, in that case, we could just continue with knight a3 again, trying to put a ton of pressure on that pawn, or we could even play this move of knight c3, right? Just starting to kick this queen around. So I personally don't think that queen d5 is a very good option. What about this idea of b5? This may be the move that you see the most often if black tries to defend the pawn on c4, but in this case, we gotta play a move such as a4, or even b3. Either of these completely work. We just gotta make sure that we are putting immediate pressure on this very overextended pawn chain. Whole idea being look. I mean, if black wants to play a move like b4, thank you for the pawn on c4. If black wants to take on e4, in that case, they're gonna be up two pawns at the moment, but they're gonna have two sets of double isolated pawns, so we can just take those pawns off on a4 and c4 literally whenever we want. And here, if I move like a6, we simply capture off that pawn, and if a takes b5 from black, we say thank you for the work on a8, and we simply have a one game. So what about this move of c6? Whole idea being, once we do take on b5, black is not taking with the a pawn, which simply loses a rook, but instead taking back with the C pawn. Well, in this case, again, we gotta keep going after this pawn chain. We cannot allow black to simply just start developing their pieces while defending these pawns at the same time. We gotta play a move here like knight C3, putting pressure on B5. And here, if a move like queen B6 from black, I like this option of B3. All idea being we wanna take towards the center of the board on c4, and if black wants to capture on b3, we have bishop takes b5 with check, followed by queen takes pawn. We've now evened out the material, and I think that most would agree here that white definitely has the edge in both development and activity of the pieces. In fact, right now, we're simply threatening to win a ton of material. Black needs to play a move here, like knight f6, so that this knight on d7 is defended. Even if knight f6 is played, though, we have ideas like rook b1, knight d5, queen c4, really just trying to put as much pressure on black's underdeveloped position as we can. But let's say black plays a move here such as e6. We now see why knight f6 was so important. We play bishop takes d7 
with check. And after taking right back, we can now take this queen off the board. And notice now that this pawn is forced to capture back. Now this rook on a1, without even having moved, slides all the way down to a8. And we're simply up a rook here, black, with a resignable position. So y'all again, going back to this position, in which case black takes on c4, I don't think that this is the best line because here white is simply going to play e3, capture that pawn right back with tempo. And if black tries to hang on to the pawn, they're going to give up more than what they're gaining. But what happens here, black goes with the advanced variation, simply pushing their pawn down the center of the board, deciding not to capture on c4. Well, in this case, white does have some flexibility in terms of how we want to move forward. For you Banco Gambit players in particular, I kind of like this idea of b4, right? Just expanding on the queen side and really trying to wipe out half of that fifth rank. Another option here for white includes this move of e3, putting some pressure on d4. And look, if a move like e3 and c5 is played, we can actually play b4, really trying to play a Banco Gambit type system up an extra move as we're putting pressure on both c5 as well as the pawn on d4. But my personal problem with playing e3 is that black doesn't have to play this move c5, but can now play knight c6, which does two things. First off, it defends the square of b4, so b4 is not possible. And on top of that, this knight simply defends the pawn on d4. If we do not capture this pawn off right away, black is going to have very easy chess with a move such as e5. And if we do take on d4, which by the way is the best option, here black takes on d4, and after knight takes and queen takes back, our minor piece. Here's why we have somewhat of an awkward game from a practical standpoint. Now, sure, if you plug this into the computer program, it's going to tell you that white is okay. But me personally, I don't like this position as this pawn on c4 is definitely making things awkward, particularly our pawn on d2. Look, if we want to develop this bishop at any point in the game, we're probably going to have to play this move d3, and this pawn on d3 is going to become a big, big target. Here, white's game is a little bit uncomfortable in terms of trying to activate our pieces and black has very easy developmental chess with moves like e5 knight f6 maybe even bishop c5 putting pressure on our f2 pawn and the moment that we play d3 bishop b4 check ideas are in the air here black with a very nice active game with a queen right in the center of the action and we can't really do anything to get rid of it very easily so y'all, again, I personally don't like this move of e3 because it does run into c6, but I do like the idea of e3, which is why I recommend that we develop our pieces first before playing this move. I think that playing it right away is a little bit premature, but if we develop our pieces first, we're going to be more ready to play this move and put pressure on black center. So here I'm recommending the option of g3 followed by bishop g2, simply fianchettoing our light squared bishop, and after move like e5 playing d3. Notice what we're doing here. With our pawns on these light squares, we're really eyeing the key light squares in the center of the board, not to mention our bishop on g2 pouncing down all the way to c6 indirectly. And here if we move like knight f6 from black, we're simply going to castle kingside. Black can play a move here like a5, and it's in this position, or a position like it, that I think e3 is now appropriate. What's the difference? Well, now if black does decide to take on e3 our bishop because this pawn on d3 can simply capture back much more smooth much more easy and if black tries to go after this pawn on d3 right away well now we have enough development to simply continue with a d4 push whole idea being we're putting some pressure on e5 if a move like e4 here we have knight h4 ready to go and if here black decides to capture our pawn on d4 let's just play knight takes back and now as white we have a lot of different threats on the board currently first off our king is castled and the black king is two moves away from doing so so this king is a little bit of a target right now on top of that we're attacking this knight on c6 with both the knight on d4 and the bishop on g2 not to mention us currently threatening to just pick this bishop right off the board so here black really does need to take this knight off but now we just take back with the bishop right again reinstating a threat and that is bishop takes b7 attacking the rook and really weakening the light squares around the black camp so here if black continues with the move like c6 we can now play knight c3 now as white we have ideas like queen d2 and queen f4 putting some pressure on this bishop on f5 we're going to continue with moves like rook e1 and rook d1 really trying to dominate those central files and i'm taking white here any day of the week so again, once we do start developing our pieces, I then think it's appropriate to play e3 because it's a whole lot easier if black decides to capture back. Now, what happens if black doesn't capture back, though? What if we see a move here such as bishop e7? Well, in this case, let's start just chipping away at the center, 
right? Let's take on d4. And here, if a move like e takes d4, play this key idea of knight a3. Now, some of you may be wondering, okay, wait, why are we playing a move like knight a3? The knight on the rim is dim. This is true, but guys, this knight is not going to stay here forever. We're eyeing ideas such as knight b5, putting pressure on d4, as well as c7, as well as the square on c2, which may look a little awkward, but this knight is not going anywhere. It's going to be putting pressure on d4 for quite a while, and it's not getting in the way of this bishop. First off, if black wants to take on a3, we're actually okay with this. Yes, it does damage our pawn structure a little bit because we had double isolated pawns on an a-file, but really we're going to have an active b-file for our rook, and we're going to have the bishop here. Black is going to have some kinks that they got to work out going forward as they don't have this key defensive presence on e7. And here, if a move like knight d7, we're simply going to play something like rook e1. Never hurts to throw the rook on the open file. And now something like Castling Kingside from Black, let's play knight b5, putting pressure on both d4 and c7, actually threatening to play bishop f4 and win material in the process. Here white with a very hyperdynamic game, not crushing by any means, but here white with some opportunities to play some fun and creative chess. So y'all, if black here plays a move like d4, I have a couple of different recommendations. One of them for you Banco Gambit players, or those of you who are thinking about playing the Banco, is simply continuing with b4. That's going to give you the inverse type position that you're going to reach out of that system. And on top of that, if d4 is played, we can play moves like g3, bishop g2, continue to develop our pieces, and then play the move of e3 instead of playing it right away. And finally, guys, our third option. What happens if black goes, look, I don't want to take on c4. I don't want to push the pawn. I simply want to play a move like c6 or e6. Well, look, there's not really a specific move that I can point you guys to that is simply better than all others. It really depends on your style of play. I mean, we currently have so many different moves that we can go with, but I personally kind of like this idea of playing b3. Maybe this is the bird's opening slash Larson's attack player coming out of me, but I like this bishop on b2 really fighting for those central squares. Notice here, if black does want to take on c4, we're completely okay by simply capturing back. This pawn may seem like somewhat of a target. It may seem as if it's kind of hanging out out there, but notice how on earth can black really get even close to attacking that pawn? On top of that, by black deciding to capture on c4, they just gave up a center pawn for literally our B pawn. So really what black did there was make the D pawn and the B pawn disappear, which in my opinion is very much in our favor. And here if black continues with something like knight f6, we have bishop b2 on the way, e3, bishop e2, castling king side, d4 can now be played without really a ton of presence from black in the center of the board. And here white with a very smooth and straightforward plan going forward. See so how what happens here if black decides not to take the pawn on c4 and really just make both of these pawns disappear off the board as the pawn on c4 in one sense is still going to be existing and here plays a move such as knight f6. Well in this case okay let's just start developing our pieces bishop b2 again fighting for those central dark squares putting some pressure on this knight on f6 and here if a move like bishop e7 we can now continue with e3 castle and king side we can play knight c3 notice how a move like d4 simply is not possible because of our pawn on e3 and our minor piece on the f-file here and now if a move like c5 from black this idea of c takes d5 is a key one at some point we are going to want to take this pawn on d5 once we have developed our pieces on our ready for a central push. Now, first off, black does have some options on how they want to capture this pawn on d5. They could take with either the pawn or play knight takes d5. Let's first take a look at this move of knight takes d5 and what to do against this. Well, in this case, I kind of recommend just taking the knight right off the board and activating our dark squared bishop. Here, if a move like queen takes d5, we're now going to continue with bishop c4, kicking this queen around. And now as white, we can simply castle king side and push in the center of the board with d4, putting some pressure on c5 and really gaining some space right in the middle of the action. And here, if black wants to take on d4, okay, we'll take back with the knight. We'll capture back with the bishop. And here, I don't really think that white should have many complaints here. Very easy position to work with. A lot of space, a lot of activity. Here's why we have ideas even such as queen f3 activating that major piece and putting our rooks on squares such as d1 and c1. Black is about to be under a ton of firepower and they're going to have to be careful. 
So y'all, again, once we do capture on d5, once we have some development, if black does capture back with the knight, okay, let's just trade down and then I d4 ideas. By the way, if queen takes d5, we always have that bishop c4 idea. But what happens here if black captures back with the e pawn? Well, in this case, let's waste no time in advancing in the center with d4. Black could take on d4, but in that case, we're simply going to capture back with our minor piece, creating a huge presence in the center. And here, something like knight c6, we can simply play bishop e2. And notice here, if black does try to play active chess with something like bishop c4, we're now going to have the option of simply capturing on c5 and giving black an isolated pawn in the center. Now, isolated pawns are very interesting, specifically in the opening, because it's both a strength and a weakness, a pro and a con, no matter which side you're looking at it from. In one sense, this pawn on d5 is giving black some space and some activity in the center of the board. But in another sense, this pawn is a big, big target. And if black ever captures on f3, that's an easy way to put even more pressure against that pawn. In this case, I would personally much rather have the white side, as we can now just play a move like castling king side. And now if we move like rook e8, let's play rook c1 again. It never hurts to throw a rook on the open file. And notice here just how quickly black can fall into trouble, particularly with this isolated pawn right in the center of the board. If we see a move here like rook c8, we can actually just take it right off, right? The whole idea being if a move like knight takes d5, thank you for the bishop. And if a move like queen takes d5, sure, this bishop is defended. So let's remove the defender. Let's play queen takes d5, take this bishop off the board. We are now simply up upon this pawn on e3, giving us a big, big edge. And it's going to be hard for black to survive this game as long as we play solid chess, continue to trade down our pieces, and look to continue activating our pieces, many of which are already active in this position. Thanks for watching, and thank you especially to all of you engaging on Patreon. Your donations are helping the Chess Giant team to continue developing more and better chess content. If you want to learn more about the extras, you can unlock by subscribing at one of our Patreon tiers. Hit up the link in the description if interested. Thanks for watching today's video. If you'd like to see our entire Hippopotamus defense playlist, click that playlist to the left. If you'd like to see our entire openings playlist, click that playlist to the right. Leave a comment down below to let me know what other videos you'd like to see covered on this channel. And as always, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for watching. Peace.